Welcome to the first step in our intro to systems engineering in practice. In this video, we will talk about how to create the initial map and overview of your system to better approach it and also be in control from the very beginning of your design. First of all, we want to start with a disclaimer. Systems engineering is a well-studied and also highly used topic, which deals with complex subjects. Many terms are used to explain these subjects, and they often have a slightly different meaning depending on the context. So don't be confused if you have heard a term be used in a different way before. The important thing is the idea and approach to these methods. When you begin the design, it is often recommended to start with listing all the requirements. This originates from the idea that we, in the end, should have a system which answers all the needs from the business and the stakeholders. However, requirements tend to quickly become chaotic. They are often dependent on other requirements, may be misleading, imprecise, or even plainly wrong. That is why we recommend beginning with the structure of your system. It might be a very simple and allowing for interpretation, but this is actually an advantage, as it lets everybody navigate and understand it, while also being flexible regarding solutions. The system architecture is also a topic which is well described and discussed. That is both a great strength, but also a great weakness to a certain degree. We could spend a long time going through definitions and theory on this topic, but we are postponing the theoretical and heavy stuff right now and focusing on the practical. In our approach, the system architecture represents an attempt to express a conception of a system to share with others. You should not focus on making a complete model of your system at this stage, but rather the common anchor point for the rest of your design. It is a central overview, which is both the common way to communicate between designers, but also allows you to demonstrate how you plan to meet the requirements, handle concerns and share this idea with other stakeholders. For us, the system architecture is the central common language between all parties of the project. Which approach to begin with depends on what you want to investigate and how open the solution space is. If you are designing a new product from scratch or want to re-evaluate a design, it can make sense to begin by asking, what is the system supposed to do? This will give you the fundamental operations or processes that the system must perform. It will allow you to begin putting these operations into context of each other in terms of inputs, and outputs to see how they affect each other. We will call this the operational architecture, and it is sometimes also referred to as the functional architecture or the process structure. When you have a good overview on the behavior of your system, you will need to ask yourself which system should perform these operations and how should they work together to achieve this. In this context, we will use the term functional system architecture for this representation but it is also called the logical architecture or the functional structure. Lastly, we need to create the overview of where these systems are in a more physical sense, so we begin to conceptualize how the system should be built. We will use the term modular system architecture to emphasize we are still designing independently of technology or physical real-life components, but other terms such as physical architecture or product structure are also sometimes used. Creating an architecture is an iterative process, so I want to emphasize there's no need to put a lot of effort into completing it before moving forward. What is important is to continuously refine it to make it more detailed as you decide on which solutions to go with in your design. Let's make a simple example and try to build up a vehicle for transportation. When you ask yourself what is the system supposed to do, Think about its operational phase, as this is most important right now. When considering the behavior of a system, it is often a good approach to frame the operations with a verb and a subject, like heat, seat, or remove oil. This is to keep a uniform structure and keep it as easy to read and convey as possible. In the most simple case, the behavior of our system is to simply transport people. Although this is a very rough design, it is the first iteration of our operational architecture. This operation can of course be decomposed into sub-elements. Here it begins to make sense to consider which stakeholders' needs and requirements belong to each operation. It makes sense to relate these operations to each other to conceptualize their dependencies. 
Noting down these operations and mapping how they interact enriches our operational architecture. Now again, we are working with a concept at this stage, so the level of detail is low, but that is okay. Now we have a map to navigate in when we speak about our system of interest. In systems engineering terms, we are actually building up the concept of operations, also called CONOPS. The first thing we can do with this map is to take a look at the stakeholder needs. As previously mentioned, they are often complex, vague, conflicting, and generally offer interpretation in many ways. With our first operational architecture in place, it is possible for us to start organizing these needs and requirements and see to which operations they should be allocated. This allows us to ask the stakeholders more precise questions like, is it a comfortable movement, comfortable climate, or comfortable taste? By going back to the stakeholders and verifying our understanding of the needs, early mistakes are captured and corrected. In this case, we discover early on that the control climate operation was missing, so we added to the architecture. This small detail potentially saved a lot of time and resources. We have illustrated the operations here in a visual way, so we consider them independently and without order. But you have probably noticed that the view already has become a bit cluttered. A mistake which many fall into is developing an architecture which is so rich in detail that the human mind loses overview. This is not wrong, it is just not beneficial for the project as such. Remember, overview is the key. If we lose that, then we are bound to miss risks and issues. To maintain the overview of our architecture, it is beneficial to structure our objects in a hierarchical structure, like a tree with branches. A hierarchical structure is better to keep the overview for our designers and stakeholders. It is easy to update, understand, and review because you can navigate between the high-level view and the very detailed view if necessary. Starting with the operational architecture and mapping their interactions allows for very wide solution space to really investigate the best approach to meet demands from the business and the stakeholders. From there, we can mature functional systems which answers the needs we have mapped in the operational architecture. When the first iteration of the functional architecture is in place, we can begin thinking about where the functions are realized and how the system should be put together. Maybe we are clever in our design and can allocate multiple functions to a single module, or maybe we need a system to have built-in redundancy for safety reasons. It is important to note here that requirements can fit into all three types of architectures, and sometimes the choice of module or function can create a new requirement which has to be considered in one of the other architectures. The crucial thing here is that as the structures are being matured and more detailed, all requirements are linked to some node in the architecture, and that all nodes in the architecture should be governed by a requirement, whether that is directly or indirectly. Requirements are a topic in of itself, and we'll go into further details with that later on. Now, this high-level approach is very good at exploring different kinds of viable designs to land at a good solution which satisfies stakeholder requirements. The downside is that it can be abstract and difficult to work with these concepts, and often a design is already matured to a point where we already know which functional systems we need. For example, we already know which kind of main functions we need from a previous project or experience from the field. In these cases, it is often fine to begin structuring the functional system architecture and keep developing that. Now that we got the fundamentals in place, let's see how it applies in our vehicle example. Our simple operational architecture where we've defined what our system of interest should do needs to be supported by the functional systems. Notice here how we disregard technology, where the systems are placed or how they are interconnected. When we start on the modular architecture, we need to make decisions as to where these systems and components are, and also if we can allocate multiple functions to the same system. In this example, the long distance headlights of the car serve two functions. At night, it lights up the road, but it is also used to signal to oncoming traffic. This way of building up the architectures allows us to gradually mature our design while keeping track of why our design is made the way it is. Now, there are two things I want to mention at this stage. 
As the systems become more and more detailed and we enrich the architecture with more nodes, it is important that we give these system occurrences a reference to keep track of them. There are many ways to do this, ranging from using a serial number to just using their name as the identifier. We highly recommend using ISO IC 81346 to create reference designations. This is an advantage because you keep the same language, use the same syntax, and have a common way to reference systems both through the design and construction of your system. In this video, we have glanced over how you are supposed to keep track of the system design and the integration between its subsystems. We know from experience that it is the interfaces between the systems which are often misaligned and leads to mistakes. We also know that requirements and management of these are a tough task. We'll go through how to monitor your interfaces and maturing requirements in a systematic way in the next videos.